Our next interview is with Michael Hollander, San Rafael, California. Michael is a longtime bookseller, an old friend. And Michael, just for our viewing audience, talk a little bit about family, uh, where you went to school, uh, a little two-minute biography. Take us up to the time that you became a bookseller. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Well, I, I, um, I grew up in Manhattan, and um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, to the Wharton School, and that was, uh, I graduated in 64. I went to work in Wall Street as a registered representative, and uh, the stock market by 1970 or thereabouts was, uh, the Dow was 600, it started, it was 600, and it looked like there's no future in this business. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, people, if I called them to invest in the stock market, they act like I was the angel of death that would hang up. And, uh, I just got tired of the negativity. So I said to myself, what can I do for a living? And I had already been a rare book collector, and I know most of the dealers in New York uh, for several years. And um, I was friendly with uh, Mr. Wyeth. Uh, I knew Irving Zucker. Uh, may I, you rest in peace. I knew all the, um, yes, may you rest in peace. And I knew quite a few of the dealers who were on Lexington Avenue and down on 4th Avenue and so on and so forth. Talk a little bit about 4th Avenue. People keep mentioning it, and no one, no one has yet expanded on what 4th Avenue used to be. Well, 4th Avenue used to be the book center of Manhattan, and there were uh, that area, well, of which Strand is the only survivor. If you went one block over from Strand, there were about six or seven shops. There also were uh, Dauber and Pine at the bottom of uh, Fifth Avenue, and um, it, it was uh, fun. I mean, it was a good place to go scouting, pre-internet days, and um, of course, I guess of rents and so on, the, one by one, they, they vanished. I remember there was one dealer there who dealt only in cookbooks. Uh, Lowen, Lowenthal? No. Um, well, Lowen, I, I know who you mean. They, they uh, did a bibliography at one point, didn't they? Yes, of American cookbooks. Cookbooks, yeah. And um, I like cookbooks, and I went in there and bought some books from her. And, um, but in getting out of the business is, uh, is, is interesting. Uh, I had heard from someone that if you want to change professions or even start a profession, there's many professions you've never heard of. So sit down and, with the yellow pages from a major metropolitan area and start reading A through Z, all the different professions, and mark down the ones that would appeal to you. And I just got as far as the le letter B, <laughs> books used in rare, and I closed it. I said, that's it. That's, that's it. for me. I know a little about it. I had a small collection, uh, which I had made money on because... Um, what did you collect as a... Art books. Art books, mainly. Yeah, modern art books. I put them all up for auction at Park Burnett, and uh, I remember I made money on them because I got recalled. I was in the inactive reserve in the Marine Corps, and they sent me a telegram saying, come on back. <laughs> Time to go to Vietnam and be a hero. So I went to Spain, and the books paid for my six-month sojourn in uh, Spain. And then when I came back, um, I went back very briefly working for Dean Witter, and the manager was a friend of mine, and I knew I wanted to get into the book business. So he said, look, I'll fire you, and um, so you'll get unemployment insurance. And uh, so I briefly worked then as uh, managing an art gallery in San Francisco. While I called every book dealer I knew and introduced myself, and unfortunately for me, about two months after I worked at this art gallery, uh, the New World Liberation Front blew up the Dean Witter offices in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I got a call saying they were looking for me, the FBI. Yeah. And it turned out there, there's another Michael Hollander in San Francisco, and he went with his family on vacation to Mexico. So they staked out his place, so because I was the most recently discharged employee, you might have a grudge. Right. And then after a week, he came back, and, they, and he said, uh, wrong Michael Hollander. So they went to the office, and they said, where, where does he live? Or, so uh, a friend of mine, my former partner, who was the commander of a, of a nuclear submarine, overheard this, and he called me and said, they're looking for you. So I picked up the phone, and I called the FBI, and I said, if you're looking for me, I'm at 575 Sutter at, a, at an art gallery. And they said, no, 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 
we not looking for? I don't know. That's a big mistake. And I hung up five minutes later. Three guys with white shirts, shirts yeah. very narrow ties, you know, walk in the last ten minutes. Did you do it? You know, brilliance. So I said, uh, no. And that was the end of that. But So I went on a trip to New York, and I was um, up at Carnegie, Carnegie Books with Mr. Kirschenbaum. Sure. And Mr. Kirschenbaum said to me, um, I have a book you can make money on, Michael. I, it's called, uh, you know, The Do Origin of Species, first edition by Darwin. And um, you can have it for $750. So I said, okay. Um, and I, I bought it. And um, later that afternoon, I called Peter Krauss at Ursus. And I said, I got a perfect copy, brand, like brand new, of the first edition of The Origin. And he said, fine, how much? I said, $1,500, double my money. He said, I'll take it. I said to myself, what an easy business. I just doubled my money in a few hours. It's marvelous. Yeah, well, it took Peter six months to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this is a book that today is worth, what, $125,000 yeah, or something like that. And that's what got me started. You know, I had suddenly had a, a, a actual proof that I could be uh, make a living in this business. So you went from art books into just... I didn't want to deal in art books because I was afraid I'd be one of these people that, um, you, know, uh, you know, the hobbyists that die of starvation but that you find uh, tons yeah, of books. books yeah. I didn't want to deal in what I really had a passion for because I felt it would affect my judgment as far as selling them. So I decided I would deal in uh, initially uh, color, fine books with colored plates, 19th century books. And when did you uh, establish your business officially? Do you remember the year? Well, my, yeah, in 71 is when I got my resale license. And um, I had to wait three years to become a member of the ABAA. And uh, so in that period of time, I built up an inventory and still collected my unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. When did you move to San Rafael? Um, well, I moved to Marin County in 1970, um, and then um, I moved around. Yeah, oh, you know, okay. I, so, I mean, I moved to San Rafael around 1985 or 86. I spent three years down in L.A. in the early 80s before I met Claire. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's it. That's okay. so the when, beginning. Hmm? So uh, you have, once you establish your firm, uh, when did you start participating in book fairs? Do you remember the first one that you did? Well, I remember the first one I went to, which was before, in 1970, in San Francisco. And I, I remember the book I bought, which was uh, Orwell's uh, 1984, first edition. And then um, I still had a knowledge of modern art books, and I was down in the Lower East Side, where they used to have, which is now Chinese, but it was then all Yiddish booksellers. There yeah. was quite a few of them there. And in the window of one of them, there was a copy of Chagall's illustrations for the Bible, which I had in my collection. So I went in and I just said, well, how much? And I had paid $300 for my copy. And this man said, well, it's used, so it, I can't sell it to you for what it came out at, but uh, I'll give you for 25 bucks. <laughs> so I figured, well, if I paid 300 for one, here's another one, $25. So I bought it. And then I went to the um, Antiquarian Bookseller Center uh, then, which is in Rockefeller Center, right. like now, and Edith Wells was running it. And there was this very tall, distinguished-looking gentleman there. And I asked him if he wanted to buy it for $300. And he said yes. And his name was Warren Howell. <laughs> so I sold it to him. Um, so that was, you know, how I met Warren. And... Uh, and then I went, you know, on from there and started doing a couple of local fairs. But I think the first major, you know, fair that I did was after I became a member. Um, I used to uh, do the New York Fair. My parents lived just five blocks away from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd uh, fly in. My mother would do my laundry. I'd have my old, <laughs> my old room back, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I'd, I'd have a booth. That's know. great. And you, obviously you did the California book fairs. California fairs. I've done fairs in, uh, you know, Chicago. Um, no, don't remind me. I've done uh, all three of the fairs in Chicago, Washington, D.C., uh, you know, aside from the regular, you know, Boston, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco fairs. I've done fairs in London. I did many of the London fairs. I know. Did a fair in Germany, um, did the Dutch fair. Uh, let's see where else. I think that's 
Oh, and I've done the Tokyo Fair uh, several times. Yeah. I interesting business. Gets me around the world. Well, it does. It does get you around the world. Um, what, how do you feel about the Internet? Um, it's, it's obviously uh, quite a, an impact on our, on our trade. Are you active on the Internet? Do you buy, sell? My books are all listed on ABE. Okay. Just on ABE? Just on ABE. Is there a reason that you just well, use Well, I was service? for several years. I was on the uh, the either I forget call the ILAP site or the uh, ABA site, and I had I got very very few, little business from, right. from it. The Abe seems to be the one that generates the most business, doesn't it? That's correct. Though lately, since you know the catastrophe, uh, it's been pretty dead. Yeah. Even that. And initially, when they first started these search services, it was wonderful. Yeah, there were fewer people on it. Yeah. But unfortunately, it educated people as to what was really rare, and books that I thought were rare um, it turned out not quite. Not, not quite rare? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I remember uh, the shock many years ago when, when I was in London, I, I saw a cookbook, and it was the Belgian Congo cookbook published in the Congo, mm. 1945, and I forget what it cost me, 150 pounds. I said, oh, it's got to be a great treasure. And then when I got home, I... Um, went on the internet and I found it's like nine other copies starting at six dollars. <laughs> and I said Well, you're not alone. A lot of people have had the same experience with something. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's I think it's thing. initially it was a great help. I mean I had customers from all over the world that I never knew You would never find existed. Them. Exactly. But lately it, this uh, I think it's it certainly hurt our business when it comes to the, except for people who deal with incredibly rare books or manuscripts, unique items, yeah. books of which there were five copies printed or something like that. Except for that, the, what I call common rare books, it's, it's definitely hurt the business, partly because it's a race to the seller when you price a book and you, you, you know, you paid X and you look online and there's 15 other copies of this book at X, how are you going to mark it up? You can't. you can't. So you wind up having you know, what the, we lo what the old joke, uh, we're the business that caused our mistake, our stock. Yeah. And it's on the shelf, and on the shelf it'll remain. Yeah, un unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you, uh, when you entered the trade, were there any booksellers who uh, were sort of like mentors to you or people you could go to and ask for advice and feel comfortable doing it? I tried. Um, you tried. I tried. Um, I offered to work for Warren for nothing. I offered to work for uh, McGee, David McGee. Uh, I used to hang out at David, and he was helpful, but yeah. he wasn't hiring anybody. Um, I knew Lou Weinstein actually offered me a job, but, you know, it was 600 bucks a month. And <laughs> when I was a stockbroker, I was making 30000 a year, so, it didn't, you know. Uh, he's the only one, Lou was the only one who actually, you know, came out and offered me a job. I didn't want to move down to Los Angeles. I, I can't say as I blame you. Um, okay. Uh, how was your transition from a, being a bookseller without a computer to being a bookseller with a computer? Did you find it seamless? Were you, were you able to transfer your knowledge of books into a computer-based system? Well, Claire helps me out. Okay. Yeah, in our so division of labor. Right? Um, <laughs> it, it took her a long time to persuade me just to get a fax machine. <laughs> I mean, the instrument of the devil, you know. I mean, I still haven't figured out how the phone works. And, uh, <laughs> thank know. God I have a young wife, and uh, she, uh, she handles all the computer stuff. She does all the, you know. So you, you really aren't wired in. She, she's the one who does it all. Right. I write out the descriptions longhand. She's the one that she, answers them. She in. answers it. She right. data entry. And corrects my spelling and <laughs> punctuation. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, if you were going to enter the book trade today, would you? And if you would, uh, how do you think it would be? Well, the, you know, the book trade really, the only thing you can really deal in now would be like the old days would be that you'd have to handle unique merchandise or something very close to it. And I would um, advise anybody who wanted to en enter the book to, you know, we're a tree. Uh, it's a tree, the antique tree, and we're a little branch of the tree. And capital is what can keep you going. You have to have the ability to buy great stuff 
and sit on it for a while. I mean, you can't, you got to have a certain amount of not just guts and intelligence, but you have to have money. And I would advise anybody, unless they have a good amount of money in back of them, um, to, to find another profession. Go to the farm boat? What? Go through the yellow pages? Go, go past B. <laughs> go past B. <laughs> That's right. And don't stop it. I mean, going. we all have this fantasy in our business, the little the little hook and, you know, carrot in front of the donkey yeah. is the, the classic phone call, you know, my, my husband died and I have this whole room full of great books and just make me an offer and get them out of the yeah. house. And, but uh, if you're going to run a profession on that, you might as well just go to Vegas and hope your number turns up. On right. The, the, Pretty the much the same thing. Yeah. Although a lot of those libraries are now going to um, auction houses where they used to come to booksellers. Well, last night, uh, my wife and I, we had dinner with a friend of mine who I've known since, in effect, birth. He's my age, he's a month older, and uh, our mothers used to wheel us around, and he's a good friend of mine, and during the meal, he's a, a lawyer in San Francisco. He said, oh, I handled an estate recently of uh, like uh, 55 boxes of antiquarian books. Uh, and I said, oh, uh, that's nice. He said, yeah, I called up Swan, and they took 80%, uh, 20% of the good things, and 80% went to Judy Lowry at Argosy, yeah, and uh, I'm just sitting there staring at him, and I'm, you know, <laughs> and I'm staring at him, and you know, and he had, he was completely clueless yeah, as he to didn't understand, did he? Yeah, and this is somebody I've known my entire life. Well, just goes to, just to show you, man. It's, yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the great challenges that we face as a business going into the future? The challenge, the main challenge in this business is propaganda because uh, the fact that, um, I mean, I was online in an ephemera affair recently and someone said to me, Michael, do you see anyone online that doesn't have gray hair? And I <laughs> looked and... <laughs> At least they have hair. <laughs> okay. But it's true. The problem is that we have an increasingly stupid population and uh, um, it's, our business seems to be um, unappealing, uh, the our product we deal in or unknown to um, most people under 40. Uh, and the, the, the thing is, um, how do we get these people excited and, and, and turn them into collectors? Otherwise, we're going to wind up being like the stamp business, which took a turn downhill uh, 15, 20 years ago and has never recovered. Never, it never came back. That's right. And it probably never will. Uh, probably never will. Just. Um, you know, it's a collectible hobby of the past now, stamp collecting, and I'm afraid we might be turning into that. Well, it, it, it's possible when you look at our association and 50% of the members are 55 years old or older, it doesn't, it doesn't bode well, does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know how we're going to turn it around. I, I don't either. Uh, it, it's so difficult to talk about the trade during, oh, during these one, times. Yeah, sure. I think the Bowmans are very important as Bums, far as yeah. what they do with their advertising in the back of the New York Times and uh, the way they handle it is they give a certain element of excitement and they, and they bring for the average per person, I mean the average intelligent person, the fact that these books exist, that you can buy them, if some, some uh, you know, author or some political thought or whatever turns you on, if you have some hero from your schooling um, that you can get uh, something that the, this person wrote or wrote on. Um, and and um, th in that aspect, they've, they've done the trade a great service uh, by doing that. But it's not enough, obviously, but it's yeah. at least it's a big help. Or it's well, a help. I, I noticed also that uh, we're about to lose one of the pillars of the bookselling community in, in the San Francisco area. Peter, yeah. Peter Howard of Serendipity. Have you have you had any occasion to see him lately, or know of his condition? I was um, I was uh, visiting last week over there, but he wasn't there. He was at a doctor's appointment, and I spoke to Nancy, and she said he looks terrible. He's lost a tremendous amount of weight, and um, he's he's not long for this world. Mm. Yeah. Does anybody have any idea what's going to happen to serendipity when? Well, well, yes. I mean, Nancy said that, uh, well, Peter's alive. He wants a lot of money for it, but there's, there's probably no one around. And when he goes, there's a trustee, and probably Nancy is going to be running it because she knows where all the books are. Right. No one else does. And uh, they're going to continue to find, try and find a buyer, of which there, since there are very few, you know, operations now that can take 
half a million books and you know and you're talking uh, about seven figures well that's the asking price now is 3.2 million feel free to buy it Michael. but does that include the property and the no. building no just the inventory just the inventory but he owns the building and the property too that he? i don't know yeah no, I'm, I'm pretty sure he does yeah in which case that might be a pretty valuable piece of property. Well, it would have been before the current economic crisis. I mean, there's, there's a lot of empty spaces now in uh, Berkeley, as there are in San Rafael, a lot of empty retail spots. Yeah, I always meant to ask you, why San Rafael? Why not San Francisco? Why not Portland? Why not Seattle? Or... Who, me? Yeah, you. What, uh, why did you settle on, on Marin County as your base of operations? Well, initially, I read uh, the electric Kool-Aid acid test. <laughs> by Tom Wolfe, where he described Muir Beach. And when I first went out there, I, I drove out to Muir Beach, and this is around 1969 or 70, early 70. And I went out there, and there were all these n naked hippies, you know, dancing to music from a, obscure groups like Santana, and, you know. <laughs> and I said, uh, this is a great, this is heaven on earth. This is beautiful, <laughs> wonderful weather. Far better than San Francisco. Better than New York. And far better than anywhere, just mm -hmm. about. Portland's cold, Seattle's cold, New York is hot and cold. Yeah. Six months of the year, this place is great, and six months of the yeah. year, it's you awful. don't want to be here. It's awful. Um, so what do you see for yourself? Uh, here you are, I don't know exactly how old you are, but I can pretty much guess. Are you going to be doing this forever? Are you, do you have a limitation on how long you want to screw with this stuff, or what? Well, I'm planning to go into like semi-retirement. I have a, I may do the Boston Affair just so I can annoy you. And, That's okay. Uh, I like being annoyed. Yeah, and I'm going to do the San Francisco f uh, ABA Fair in February, and then I'm going to uh, pretty much just uh, slow it down. I have an inventory to get rid of, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it's like everyone else. Even Lou Weinstein showed up at the LA San Francisco Fair, and he's supposed to LA Fair. Uh, you know, it's in your blood. I mean, I can be, anybody in this business can be retired, and if they get the right phone call, they're not retired anymore. anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know exactly, exactly what you're saying. Uh, so, uh, you expect to do no more book fairs after San Francisco? Is that going to be your, your last one that you think Well, of? I might do the San Francisco fair two years after that. It depends on my health. I'll be 70 then, and, you know, I mean... Yeah, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's, it's not you know, easy. It's not forty easy odd years in this business, and uh, I mean, it's a lot. Unless you own a brothel, I mean, yeah. forty. Oh, <laughs> you're you get bored. Wealthy. What? If you're independently wealthy, it's it, it, it's fun to do this too. No, I don't work to live. You know, I live. To uh, live to work. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, what does what does uh, your wife think about this uh, whole book business? She loves it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She mm -hmm. loves books. You know, you taught her. I, I, oh, I didn't teach her. I taught her something. Well, I mean... You probably uh, taught her a lot more. She likes the book business. and there's, there's no question about it. And she likes books when I get, uh, you know, a nice book. She loves looking at it. Sometimes she grabs it and keeps it for herself. She's got a lot more books than I do. <laughs> that, that's a tough situation. <laughs> you know, don't show her anything because you're afraid she might take it for her own collection. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's got her own. She's got, got a a good thousand books in her office. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. And she's, yeah. unlike other people, she's actually read them. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah. All right, before I let you go, look into your crystal ball and tell me what you think the book business is going to be like 5, 10, 15 years into the future. If you remember, uh, for our newsletter, I wrote an article called The Book Trade in uh, 100 Years from Now. Uh, I mean, it was done with tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. But uh, I'm talking seriously. What are we going to be like 15 well, years from now? What do you think the, the business, the trade is going to be like in 10 or 15 years? Or will we have a trade? No, I think we'll always have a trade. I mean, there's still stamp dealers. Yeah, it's You true. know, uh, coin dealers are thriving right now. So the money's going in there. But I think that the, this business is going to shrink. I think there are people in this business who... Um, went in it for the, quote, prestige, or they had nothing better to do. And they're yeah. going to find out, or they're finding out right now, that it's really no fun when you don't sell them. <laughs> <laughs> when so, you're sitting there. <laughs> well, when I got in this business, Shepard's directory uh, was this thick. 
and yeah. now it's like this thick. And yeah. I think in 15 years it's going to be back down to back this to thick. Yeah. And then we're 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 going to be reduced to people who are really serious in this business and have uh, the financial wherewithal to withstand uh, mediocre times. I won't say bad times, but so much in this world now depends on outside yeah. influences. You know, another 9/11. Another crazy uh, meltdown in the market, and uh, you know. But there's always going to be people who love rare books. Uh, question is, how many of them yeah, are going to be around to uh, provide a good living for the myriad of antiquarian booksellers? Yeah. But uh, from a demographic standpoint, we're in trouble because there just aren't enough young, young faces. Young That's faces, the main yeah. problem right now. Uh, well, how do how do we how do we get young people interested in what we do? Well, um, a lot of people should go around to universities and speak to the seniors, That's and just nice. you know, and just tell them about the business. I mean, a lot like me going through the yellow page. A lot, a lot of people aren't even aware. The standard joke in this business that we've all been um, faced with is people come up and say, "You can make a living from this business," yeah, that's and we have exactly. to tell people, "Yes, you can make a good living. You can make a very interesting living. It takes you around the world." You, it's a treasure hunt. You have moments where you go, oh, my God, oh, this is just the most wonderful <laughs> bargain I've ever seen in my life. It's still happening. And you can, if you express that kind of excitement and enthusiasm with people, you might turn a few people into the, into the profession. Well, great, Mike. Thanks for the interview. Our well, time is up. Appreciate you participating. And uh, say hello to Claire for me. I will. I will. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Michael.